Welcome to the Nordic uh, Nature and Food Forum. Today we're going to talk about the big questions around the climate, around the food systems, but of course we are meeting in the midst of severe crisis. We are meeting in the midst of the pandemic, the climate crisis, and of course also the Ukraine crisis that we're watching. Uh, as a UN organization, let me just first repeat the condemnation of the UN Secretary General, who is also the, um, the board chair of UN Global Compact, that this is a situation that we should not be in, uh, and we are looking forward to find a solution for it. While that is going on, we need to use the whole UN system to deliver uh, humanitarian aid to the victims uh, in Ukraine. Uh, and of course, we need to make sure that we also continue keeping up the pressure on, on the different kinds of actors in this conflict. Today, we got a, no we got a message that uh, our member Yara's office in Kiev has been hit. Uh, and we, of course, send all our best regards to Yara and, and their work. And it just shows all of us how this is actually striking each and every one of us, and not only the people in Ukraine. So this is something where we have to stand together moving forward, the whole UN system and, <coughs> uh, and the countries around. But today's topic is food and nature. Uh, today we see that uh, the, climate, the Intergovernmental Climate Panel of the UN has delivered their second report after the COP26 last year. It, it shows us the new things in this report that is launched just now uh, around this time. Uh, is how important mitigation is, preparedness, adaption to all the severe crises we are seeing around the world. Being it extreme weather, uh, natural catastrophes, or also back in Norway, different kinds of weather situation we have seen the last couple of years. This is the picture we have today uh, when we are starting this um, Nordic Forum. And of course, we know that the food system is one of the key, key factors to make sure that we can adapt to all the climate changes that is ahead of us. Of course, more severe in the global south than in, uh, in the Nordics, but also here we will see the consequences. Um, we know that 52% of agricult agricultural land is already degraded. That's just one example of how big the challenges are. Uh, we are going to listen to four panels today. One panel is it's on the, the role of, uh, of the boards in companies, one on policy, one on research, uh, and of course also one on finance. Uh, personally, I'm especially looking forward to, to moderate the discussion between Nordhura and EAT uh, on policy and the future of the food system. But before that, we're going to get um, uh, you know, many good speakers before getting to the, to the third panel. And uh, even before that, we get a keynote from the CEO of uh, Orkla. Uh, Jan Ivar Semlich is with us and will be now the next on stage. The floor is yours. Thank you so much, uh, Kim. Uh, the UN has called this decade for the decade of action. And together we must be the generation to win the race against climate change and solve other sustainability challenges. The food value chain holds a key to solving these challenges when it comes to reducing climate gas emissions, protecting biodiversity, and ensuring good working conditions for everyone in the value chain. It's a privilege to speak today around the sustainable food systems to political leaders and business leaders who understand the importance of this topic and want to find solutions to the challenges at hand. I will touch upon the following with a business perspective. What's the task we have in front of us? What are the solutions? And what will it take to build sustainable food systems? But first, a brief introduction to Orkla as a company. Orkla is a leading food and consumer goods company, and our mission is to improve everyday life for the consumer with sustainable and enjoyable local brands. And to give you a quick overview of our position as a company, I've chosen to highlight three topics. We own 300 brands, which we are proud of labeling with the Orkla brand. 
We are the leading supplier of branded goods in the Nordics, in the Baltics, in Central Europe, and also in South of India. And lastly, our brands typically hold strong market shares in their local markets. Climate change is without a doubt the greatest environmental challenge faced by the world today, and taking climate change is a collective responsibility. The food system holds a key to solving the climate crisis and to limit the rise in temperature to 1.5 degrees, according to the Paris Agreement, there is a need to cut the climate footprint from the food that we produce and eat in half. This is a common responsibility. And in Orkla, we have therefore set ambitious science-based climate targets aligned with the 1.5 degrees target, both for our own production and the whole value chain. Already we see good results. We have almost reached our goal of 62% reduction in emissions from own operations, and that's compared to 2014. And around 46% of the energy which we use come from renewable sources. We are also intensifying our efforts to reduce indirect climate effects generated by the production of raw materials scope 3, which is very important. More than 90% of Orkla's emissions come from the supply chain, in a large part from dairy, meat and agricultural production. And cutting these emissions is a huge challenge, which requires collective efforts. For more than a decade, we have engaged with our suppliers to make sure that raw materials that we buy are not linked to tropical deforestation. And finally, we want to guide and inspire consumers to make smart climate choices through communications and product labeling. And last but not least, we see a big business opportunity in encouraging people to eat less meat and more plant-based food. And we have the ambition to become a European leader within plant-based food which uh, with brands you see on the slide here, uh, with Natuli, uh, we want to be the change. Another important uh, element to reduce our climate footprint is food loss. Food waste must be reduced for greater food security and environmental sustainability. Globally, one billion tons of food is wasted each year, one billion and a staggering one-third of all food produced globally is lost or wasted. This is a challenge that we need to handle together. It's important to protect and preserve food across the value chain, starting with ourselves. In Norway, the food sector signed an agreement on food waste reduction with the Norwegian government in 2017 with a common commitment of cutting food waste in half by 2030. And in Orkla, we are proud to say we go even further. Our goal is 50% reduction in food waste from our own operations already by 2025, again compared to our baseline in 2014. And through some of our brands, we are also raising awareness about the impact of food waste and inspiring consumers to rethink the relationship with leftover food. And in this aspect, innovation is important. Discarded food, for example, should not end up in landfills, but be utilized for other purposes. We need to create new loops and explore new markets for food waste in a circular economy. Population growth put a pressure on food supply and more frequent extreme weather is a growing challenge for farm production. At the same time, we see that agricultural practices may contribute to loss of soil fertility, be a source of pollution and threat to biodiversity. Of course, the challenges vary from country to country. Tropical commodities like palm oil and cocoa are linked to severe challenges, such as deforestation and violations of workers' rights. But to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and protect biodiversity, there is a need to mobilize also in countries like the Nordic, even though we have good reason to be proud of our 
agricultural sector. There is a need to accelerate the transition into sustainable agriculture, but we also need to establish a better common understanding of what the key principles of future farming should be. And in a way, we should make farmers the new heroes. In Orkla, we are committed to using raw materials that are produced with the interest of human beings, animals and the environment in mind. And we hope to be able to verify that the production of key raw materials are sustainable produced by 2025. We are using a framework for sustainable agricultural production, farm sustainability assessment, developed by the industry organization SAI platform, Sustainable Agricultural Initiative, as a guide for deciding which agricultural standards to use. Now, many fish stocks worldwide are subject to overfishing or in a vulnerable state. And at the same time, plastics, other types of pollution and global warming are threatening marine wildlife and important ecosystems. Sustainable fishing and protection of the oceans is critical to secure the long-term availability of fish as an important part of our diet and to preserve precious natural resources. And in Orkla, we will contribute to sustainable fishing and healthy oceans by sourcing our marine resources in a sustainable way and fight pollution of the sea. And our 2025 goal is to be able to verify sustainable sourcing of all the marine ingredients that we use. And we are coming close to the target of having 100% MSC certified herring, mackerel and cod from the North Atlantic Sea. But due to unsuccessful political negotiations about fishing quotas, certain fish stocks no longer qualify for the MSC certification. In other words, for us to succeed with our sustainability ambitions, we are dependent upon political action. To sum up, we all need to step up our efforts to make food systems more sustainable. Business has a key role to play and collaboration across the value chain is very important and to protect natural ecosystems, whether it's about tropical forests, oceans, or farmland. There is also a need for political collaboration across countries. And we hope that the development of a new global deal for nature this year will be successful. I also believe that it's important to have framework conditions which are predictable and which incentivize the transition to sustainable food systems without putting an unreasonable burden on business. And as companies, we have a responsibility, but we should also explore the business opportunities linked to future food. And uh, like we do in Orkla with our investment in seafood, uh, seaweed, currently an immature sector, but with great potential for future growth. So thank you for uh, listening in, and I'm looking forward to the rest of the day. Thank you so much for that, uh, Jan Ivar. Uh, we will now continue to the next, to the next panel uh, that will look at uh, the business role in a sustainable food system. Um, and this time from a, a, a board chair or the boardroom's perspective, Johanne Hughes, that is the head of CSR in Orkla, will then take us through the panel and do the moderation. Uh, welcome. Thank you. I just have to say that uh, I'm the head of sustainability in Orkla Foods, not the whole Orkla, because it's a big company. Um, and thank you because uh, you heard Jan Ivar Semlich uh, speaking about the many sustainability challenges facing the food system. And we will use the next 30 minutes to talk about how individual, individual companies and their boards uh, can and must play an important role and how we in different ways 
can contribute to tra transform the food system. So let me introduce the first panel of the day. Therese Bergjord is the managing director in Skretting, a global leader in providing innovative and sustainable nutrition, nutritional solutions and services to the aquaculture industry. And you are also the chair of the board uh, in CBOS, a leading initiative for developing sustainable seafood production and improved ocean health. And welcome to you, Arnard Thormason. He is the chairperson of Marell, a multinational food processing company based in Iceland and a global leader in transforming the way food is processed. So welcome to you both. Thank you. Teresa, you are today both presenting Skretting and Sibos. Can you please tell us briefly how you and Skretting work with sustainability and the company's sustainability journey, but also shortly present the Sibos initiative and the background for establishing the uh, initiative? Yes, I can. Thank you so much. I'll spend a couple of minutes uh, on, on this introduction. Uh, uh, first of all, uh, Skretting is a, uh, forms part of a Nutreco. It's a, it's a Dutch privately owned global company. Uh, it's, uh, as you said, a fish and shrimp nutrition company, which means we basically we produce uh, feed for farmed fish and for farmed shrimp. It's a large player where we have uh, around 2.8 billion euros revenues and we have presence across, across the globe. And, and the mission of uh, Skretting is to feed the future. And we definitely have to roll, a role to play with regards to transforming the, the, the food value chain. Uh, and uh, also well linked to CBOS. The this, this seafood is one of the most efficient ways to produce center plate protein. And by that, I mean um, adding, of course, to the health benefits and the, and the good taste of the seafood. Uh, we have lower co feed conversion rates and higher edible portion of, uh, compared to other uh, protein production. And um, uh, going into that feed production, feed ingredients uh, consist of uh, proteins, fat, carbohydrates, and micro ingredients. And all uh, ingredients must be sourced uh, responsibly. FAO estimate that aquaculture will grow by 32 percent by 2030. That means that we as an industry have to produce 40 million tons more of ingredients. We need to use more ingredients and compared to today in fact, I think we produce 3 million tons. So it's a huge step up. We have to do more with less. And uh, our sustainability focus and our sustainability journey, it's uh, a focused one. And first of all, we cannot do it alone. Uh, we partner up with science, we partner up with the other large companies, and we formed CBOS, or CBOS was formed uh, to uh, enhance uh, how we collaborate across the value chain to make step change on the food system. So it's science-based, it's uh, Asia, Asian companies, global companies coming together to, to really uh, lay the path forward in concrete actions. Uh, and also uh, internally in, uh, in the feed uh, production, uh, we use, it's a focused journey, we use our R&D capabilities to enhance the animal health because survival rate, animal health is crucial for the whole food system. Uh, we use uh, ingredients, 94% uh, of the footprint in a feed production comes from the raw materials we use. So it's absolutely essential that we uh, produce more with less. Uh, we are uh, sourcing the right raw materials and that we do that in the right way. So we have set specific targets to that. We work with others such as CBOS to, to make it happen. Uh, short introduction over to you, Hanna. Thank you, Teresa. And I, I must say that the uh, CBOS initiative is very exciting and uplifting for the future of seafood production. Um, so over to you, Arnaud. Can you please give us a brief introduction to Marel and why sustainability is high on your agenda uh, in your company? Thank you, Arnaud, and thank you for, for being here today. I think it's a very interesting panel. Uh, Marel is a food solutions company. We work mostly with uh, poultry meat and fish processing equipment. So we do equipment solutions and software for this business. Uh, we are we will be 40 years uh, next year, <coughs> and and, uh, and we have been kind of and we were formed around sustainability or, or using products or, or, or yields. So, for example, <coughs> we started in the fish industry. 
and uh, uh, you uh, you can say or you have filled it, it was then around 68 percent and today it's like 83 percent and still increasing so it's about using the product uh, more efficiently uh, today we are around uh, 1.4 billion uh, euros company in revenue we are operating in 130 countries so we're all over the world uh, we uh, plant ourselves of uh, have always through uh, economic cycles uh, we uh, use six percent in, in a, uh, our innovation effort which is also and there and there of course we embed the sustainability thinking because now every product that goes through development phase in our company needs to go through a sustainability check so we do a kind of a so when you are going through these various gates in the, in the innovation process you need to to uh, to pass these sustainability measures so so i mean so so we say that we were data driven from day one and uh, and working with the industry to to increase yields and, and efficiency and sustainability and we actually have kind of uh, embedded more i would say more, more firmly in our on, in our vision because we had had our had our vision, which was you know we, we are transforming the way through this process, but we are now have added also that and and we have a vision of a world where food is the quality food is produced sustainably and affordably. So we have also kind of embedded, and I think that will come back to our discussions uh, today around the role of business and how how you can kind of embed sustainability in in the business. But uh, this is maybe just high level level of Marela. I mean, we are working in in, uh, in these food solutions, and of course in in uh, in meat, poultry, and fish, which are also you know especially with meat, which has high uh, which is a uh, high contributor to uh, to carbon emissions. So we're also trying to to help our customers, and that's basically. I mean, we are doing a lot of uh, sustainability work within Marel, and you know. We also see our biggest kind of contributing factor is to help our customers who are, you know, doing, who are uh, processing food uh, all around the world to be more sustainable and using, uh, you know, better resources, water, electricity, yields, and so on. Thank this is, this yeah. is basically a very high, really very short two minutes introduction of, of mine. <laughs> Thank you, Arnaud. And, and it's really exciting mm -hmm. to hear about uh, Marel's amb ambitions to transform the way food is processed and uh, how you work with sustainability. I think we in Orkla have a lot to learn from, uh, from you as well. Um, you heard Jan Iver Semlich, uh, my CEO, talking about Orkla's responsibility in the green transition uh, in the keynote. but. What responsibility do you think big companies have in the green transition, Arnaud? I think they have a huge responsibility, and, uh, and not only the big ones, because there is a there is a lot of debate around this. You know, should we just wait for the government to set all the standards and then we kind of move on? But I think uh, businesses can, and, and there was, I think, a very big message from the COP26. It came out that you know the, the businesses were really contributing. I think you know that was a, a, I saw a, a kind of a big change there with businesses were stepping up and saying we can do things. You know even though we are we are want to have the standards and, and we want to have that aligned, but businesses can do a lot and, and and big companies can do it because they can work with both their supply chains. You know to to you know around the procurement and how you can kind of source your 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 things and in Marens. Uh, kind of uh, situation, as I mentioned earlier, it's working with our big customers who are all around the world, you know, producing food for consumables and, and for for uh, for the for consumption. So, I mean, if we can kind of uh, contribute or, or can make them more sustainable, then we are kind of uh, contributing to the sustainability of the world because it is a global uh, issue, and uh, you you are not solving anything. By just doing yourself and focusing on, you know, your, uh, of course you need to do it, but if you only focus on, you know, how you kind of reduce the waste from your own production, uh, you, you need to look at it in a bigger way. And I think big companies, of course, are being big and, you know, having big purchasing power, you know, having a, a, having a kind of influence on their customers, they can uh, they can be very, very strong if they are kind of uh, role models in this area. Thank you. And... Um 
Uh, I think I know that you are uh, a concern about this in Skretting, uh, Margrethe Teresa, and but how is it in? Uh, how can CBOS play a role in this green transition? Well, if you if you uh, CBOS was uh, formed back in two thousand and twelve and has spent a significant uh, amount of time to align uh, with science uh, with the companies on a on a joint set of targets. And uh, of course, if you have uh, the 10 of the largest seafood companies in the world together with the science to try to put out a, a route uh, or a good way forward, you can imagine how that can ripple out in the value chains, both uh, into uh, other uh, customers of, of the members of Zebos, but also with the suppliers. And where we see, um, uh, we focused on, on several areas, such as uh, carbon footprint, of course, uh, biosecurity, biodiversity, temperatures, uh, plastics. There are so many areas that we can actually uh, discuss and adhere to, and we are. So I say that we can never, we cannot do it alone. You have to work in the, inside the, the whole value chain, uh, as also Anna says, because I can do uh, inside of Skretting, we can fix scope one and two, and that is our own in our hand, but it's such a tiny little part of the challenge. Uh, most of it is either out towards the consumers or back towards the producers, the farmers of the soy, of the wheat, et cetera. So we have to do it uh, together and, and collaboration in uh, in organization like CBOS is, is fantastic in that respect. And, and why also is it so scientifically based? Because it's so easy to say, I will reduce my footprint. I will step up on sustainability, but the, the devil's in the details there. So you need to understand, you need to talk apple to apple. And these kinds of collaboration will, will help us establish the standards that we need to have to be able to move forward. And uh, I, I'm really excited by collaborations uh, across on, on this topic. Mm. Yeah, and, and I think we have a lot to learn from you both concerned to how you think about partnerships and collaboration, uh, both across uh, the value chain, but as competitors as well. Um, mm -hmm. And I think we have, this is the way to work forward. Um, okay, I've been working as head of sustainability in Oracle Foods for nearly five years. And as a company, we have come a long way in our sustainability journey, uh, but and one reason for that is uh, you heard my CEO and and our sustainability work is uh, the passion comes from the executive board uh, right across the line of organization and into the support units. So I'm wondering, uh, and the first question is for you, Anna. Uh, how have you rooted the sustainability work uh, in your company and in the board? Um, and what c role do you think boards have to influence the sustainability work? I think boards have a huge role, and uh, and I think that is uh, that I mean that hasn't really been the case up until up until now, uh, and uh, we're seeing it also in Maril. I mean, when we started on the journey a few years ago, it was just you know there was a li this little unit you know doing this, and and we we kind of got some information about it, and uh, but uh, but now it is more embedded. And we, and we did the structure within Maril, so we have like a sustainability kind of function within the CEO office, and it kind of comes regularly to the board. So, and we also kind of embed it in all the all our committees at the board level as well. So we do in the audit committee, we look at you know the uh, non-financial uh, reporting or the ESG reporting. Uh, we we look at the, those kind of um, data there. So the audit committee is is thinking about it as well. In the remuneration committee, we also last year for the first time we we put in a sustainability scorecard in in uh, kind of in our um, uh, our incentive program. So the bonus targets for for the for the executive team and uh, and others in the company. So that was also a way to try to embed sustainability and let everybody kind of think about it. So so I mean and, and then you they come and report and we have it just through the cycle throughout the board year that we kind of. We have a now a sustainability program, which we started at the end of last year, which is now kind of on the board's agenda. So we will kind of, you know, follow it through. It goes on to 2026. So, it, but it gives us kind of a, a tool to to measure how we are kind of, you know, progressing on the sustainability journey. So I think that is really important. And and we are also see, seeing it, and I'm seeing it within my board. In my uh, is that you know, the interest there has, you know, 
grown exponentially in the last two or three years. So, so I mean, so they are asking, you know, and we are asking, the board is asking on this matter. It's not just, you know, as before, the, the, the kind of management was more kind of uh, producing, uh, giving us some updates on it. Now it's the board asking, are we doing the right thing there? And could we do this better? And we have lively debates around sustainability. So I think that's, uh, I, that's what I see as a kind of a key key change now that this is this has been put up higher up on the agenda and, and boards are really taking taking it to their heart and, and we are doing that as well yeah thank you and i, I think it's uh, yeah we are uh, at the same place in Orkla, i think but uh, it's it's a journey and how is it in skretting uh, teresa yeah it's also it's also a journey here first of all it has uh, we realized a couple of years ago there has to be a, an integrated part of strategy and, and uh, with that, I mean, uh, uh, you can, uh, for instance, on the raw material, the footprint, we, we needed to work closely with the procurement uh, area of the organization to be able to step move forward on the sustainability targets on the, on the raw materials that we buy. Uh, for operational, the scope one and two, we need to give that responsibility to the operating people and to the people out in the business who really uh, can influence it. And uh, we need... Uh, uh, so we pushed uh, the responsibility wider out in the organization to engage more, but we need to have the capabilities as well to be able to point uh, everyone in the same direction. And that is the role as the board. Uh, we, we need to say, okay, these are the ambitions we set and this is the capabilities we need and we will then work with the business to deliver on the different targets. For instance, uh, on CAPEX proposal, uh, sustainability footprint, energy usage is key to how we approve and, and uh, discuss uh, big CAPEX as we do. And uh, also on, our, on the operational side, we discuss with the operating people, how do you uh, make, uh, become more energy efficient? How can you produce less water? You know, all of these things. So, so it has to be an integrated way in, in how we, we uh, do the business. And then we need to have good spokespeople who are able to articulate it, what uh, all, the, all the things that are happening. And I must also admit, we can do so much more uh, uh, than, than we are doing today. So, so it's just uh, starting in my view. Yeah, thank you. And um, I think it's really good uh, to hear that uh, you are integrate uh, the sustainability work in uh, all operations, because I think that's the way you can move things forward. But, um, and you have uh, KPIs, as you said, uh, Arnaud, but how important are they concerned to traditional profitability KPIs? Um, because I know that we have sometimes dilemmas concerned to uh, investment in sustainability versus like uh, in other cases. Uh, mm -hmm. How do you deal with this kind of dilemmas? I mean, they, they are, of course, important as well, and, and that, that kind of goes into, like I said before, you know, embedded in your incentive system, then you then it comes in. And also, I mean, Mar has also sustainability anchored to their finance, to our financing. Okay. So we have financing, so we have kind of uh, sustainability KPIs in our in our uh, financing, which we did in 2020. So so that's also a kind of a way to kind of link it together, the finance and the, uh, and the sustainability. And of course, I mean, in, in essence, sustainability and as we look at it from the market perspective, it is good business. It is actually, I mean, and I think that is also very important for companies to kind of try to kind of embed it in their value, in their value proposition. You know, what what is what is Mare for for our customers? We are we are sustainable. So I mean, so 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 what we do around sustainability, and you know, both to help them and also to be more sustainable ourselves, will in the end uh, kind of. Uh, should reap financial results, so I think. So I think we are. Th this is the link we are. We are trying to make, and I totally want to kind of echo what Teresa said about you know the uh, uh, like capex, big capex uh, kind of decisions that come to the board. We have now you know embedded sustainability anchors into those as well. So it's when you are doing you know a factory somewhere, you know then then you need to have as a KPI in that as well some sustainability. The diversity kind of uh, angles as well. So, so and I mean, when you do that, then it starts, then it stops to be kind of a trade-off between either doing something profitable or doing something sustainable. It, it should be, I mean, it, it's it, doing something sustainable should be 
in the end, it will be profitable if you do it right. Yeah, that's good to hear. And uh, um, yeah, do you want to comment or say something about that, uh, Teresa, before I s go further on? Yeah, I, ca I can just uh, add that uh, to, to uh, I'm, I'm very passionate about knowing where we are, where are our hotspots in the organization and our value chains. And, and I think we need to embrace the life cycle approach and the life cycle mindset. And, and that therefore, we cannot do it alone. So there's no way around being competitors, being suppliers, being customers. There's no way around a, a, a deep collaboration. So if, if each and one company dive into their own uh, direct influence uh, thing and then uh, engage uh, on platforms like CBOS and like other to, to, to figure out how to do it. And, and in a day to day, it's uh, discussions with one client uh, asking what, what your CEO said, uh, uh, we want this and we want this, and then we turn to our suppliers and it's, it, that's how it goes. And that's how you can actually make, uh, make uh, a good uh, progress. So apple to apple collaboration, uh, a comparison, uh, looking, embrace the value, uh, the life cycle um, uh, mindset, and then uh, just dive into it. It's what we need to do. Thank you. And uh, uh, I'm just wondering, because we don't have so much time left, but uh, if you can choose uh, or highlight one sustainability goal on how you can contribute uh, to, uh, to a better food system, which sustainability topic or goal is the most important uh, for you as a company? And how do you work to meet that goal? You can start, Anna, if you want to. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a very good question, uh, but tough one as well. I mean, uh, I think we have, uh, there, there, there are a lot of you know, issues that we are dealing with. So just to taking one out and, and saying that's most important, but uh, I think we are, I mean, as was mentioned in the beginning of this, uh, this seminar here, we are looking at this, this uh, uh, I would say, decade of action. So I think the climate, you know, carbon emission reduction is the, is the key one that we need to focus on moment and and, uh, and, uh, and I mean we have also I think everyone has a little bit of a sense now after the pandemic you know how do we come out of the pandemic do we do go totally back to you know fly in fly out for everything or do we do more like like this with hybrid of course it would have been great to to be with you all at the same at the, at the in, in our floor where we where we are but but we can do more you know in in this sense but and, and to keep the reductions reductions down so I think that is going to be the so that's it's also it's important but it's also the challenge now when we are kind of coming out of the pandemic so i would maybe maybe highlight that as a as a as a as one of the of the of the biggest uh, thing that uh, that we have but i mean but the others are also important thank you yeah and i think clim the climate question is uh, is really important and <coughs> uh, we as a company we know that uh, our mission comes from uh, 10% comes from scope one and two, but 90% mm -hmm. comes from scope three. And we have to work with that. Uh, I, I, what do you think, uh, Teresa, in this great thing? No, I, I agree to that uh, with, uh, with the carbon emissions. It's really important, but we, we must also remember that the world population is gr growing and we need to ensure zero hunger on this world. So we need mm -hmm. to strike the balance. People need to eat, and that is a huge responsibility, also in a sustainability manner. So working with our own value chain, bearing in mind that, uh, that we need to have uh, available proteins for, for, for a global population. Yeah. And uh, how do you work? Um, uh, you work with uh, probably like in the climate discussion uh, with food waste in different ways. Uh, but how do, you do, how do you work with food waste in, uh, in Skretting? Uh, in food waste, we we uh, we work mainly with uh, byproducts. So we use uh, byproducts uh, in in the value chain uh, to uh, use them inside uh, of our uh, feed production. Okay. Yeah, I see. And how uh, how can you contribute to reduce food waste uh, for uh, companies, uh, mm -hmm. Annette? I mean, we can of course uh, we can. Find uh, uh, to help them find different value streams, new value streams for the for the products. I mean, if you are so, so you can try to use the whole like like I mentioned in the beginning around the utilization of, for example, of this 
that's the one thing. And then also to reuse. I mean, we are we are having plants where people or companies reuse, for example, the water that they because there's a lot of water that goes in food uh, processing factory. So if you can take it out, clean it, and then reuse it again, uh, it's also builds into that we are doing the life cycle analysis of our equipment. Can we use that again? Is that possible? You know, the circular economy is very much kind of thing that we are looking into at the moment and trying to, because we are we are selling our big machines all over the world. Can we, can we you know, in what way? And, and we have been, of course, in, uh, making that more, you know, standardized and, and kind of so it is more kind of uh, standardized solutions. So, it, so you, you are you're able to use maybe some part of it and something else. So, I mean, there's all sorts of these issues where you can, Find some ways to to uh, to uh, to minimize my waste in the production. Yeah, can I can I add just a little bit, or are we out of time? Yeah, we have the time. Yeah, so uh, I just want to also to say that we can use uh, novel ingredients. We can use, for instance, in in some of the uh, part of the business, we use insects and insects meal that feed on food waste. Uh, so it is there is a good circular story also around that, uh, and. Uh, uh, we can also imagine uh, uh, investments in alternative proteins like uh, mosa meat, like blunalu, trying to develop uh, other type proteins that we haven't seen before. So there are many opportunities uh, if we look uh, on the long uh, uh, horizon. And that's very interesting. And I think that, that the circle, we have to think like find this circle uh, innovations uh, in the future. Um, mm. uh, and that's uh, that's very interesting. And uh, we have been talking a lot about uh, h how companies like yours work with internal change in terms of transforming the food system. And and I think the the today's listeners can learn a lot from how you work with sustainability in your companies. Uh, one question that I was thinking about the the last question before we end here uh, is how you build build knowledge uh, uh, and competence in your uh, organizations. Yeah, I think it is. I mean, it, it has to do with uh, like I've been talking about a little bit, kind of embedding it into your business. So I mean, you have to you have to al align it with your overall strategy. You know, don't have a sustainability strategy. That is totally different from your from your company strategy. So that's what people are focusing on. Your values. How can you kind of connect that to sustainability? As I mentioned before, connect it to the, your uh, value proposition. You know what you do is that you know it is sustainable. Uh, you have to ma make people also and the kind of kind of uh, the organization uh, think more long term. You know, start to, to because the, the uh, environmental challenges, for example, are, are, are long term challenges, even though we are kind of uh, emergency to act, but it, it takes, a, takes a long time. And, uh, and, and, and also, and, and in Mara, we are working very much with this partnership kind of mentality throughout the company and also with, with customers. Uh, I've also mentioned the incentivized pay related to. To, to ESG, I think, I mean, you need to use all these uh, leverages, leverages that you have to, to kind of get the organizations moving on this, because it is important, for example, for Mare, that our people who are selling, they think about sustainability as well, because we are selling sustainability. So I think that's, uh, it's really kind of, you know, you need to, to use every, every measure you have within the company to, to try to kind of get everyone uh, uh, aligned in the companies. So it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a multiple ways to do it. Yeah. Do you want to say a short, have a short answer on that as well, Teresa, before we end? No, I, I mentioned it before. Yeah. Capabilities is key to be able to build the transparency and the knowledge that we need to have to compare Apple with Apple on these topics. Yeah, thank you. And I, I'm afraid we're running out of time, but uh, this has been a very interesting and fulfilling conversation, at least for me, but I think for the listeners also, as well. Uh, so I just uh, want to thank you for having this conversation with me and wish you both a great day. So thank you. Uh, and now it's the time for, the, yeah. Uh, now it's the time for the second uh, panel discussion. Uh, the role of research in sustainable food system, uh, and this is led by Kat Karina Hanthammer from Abelia. So thank you.
Welcome to this session uh, on the role of research and sustainable food system. For the next half hour, we will have a panel discussion um, concerning uh, about our food, our health, our planet, and our future. My name is Karina Hunamer. I'm the head of the research and higher education at Abelia. I would like to welcome our two panelists, which we have this half hour, and that's Director Line Gordon from the Stockholm Resilience Center and the CEO of the Norwegian Research Institute, Nofima, Eivin Filling Jensen. You are both very experienced in this topic, and I challenge both of you to say something uh, in the beginning about your company or institute, and Lina, the floor is yours. Karina, uh, just it seems to be uh, a mix up here. Uh, I have the title of Lina, and uh, she has my title underneath. But uh, I think you can see it's a gender difference between us. Yes. So, uh, <laughs> I see that. I, I guess the uh, technical person will organize that. But uh, welcome uh, to both okay, of no. you. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to much. both of you. Um, as I said, I have challenged you to say something um, in the start so we can start the discussion afterwards. So, Lina, the floor is yours, and after that, it's Evin. Thanks a lot, and thanks for correcting the, <laughs> the name <laughs> tag, <laughs> etc. Anyway, um, so I'm the director of Stockholm Resilience Center, and Stockholm Resilience Center is an interdisciplinary research environment based at uh, Stockholm University. We gather around 130 people under one and the same roof, but they have multiple different backgrounds in terms of their scientific backgrounds and and also work, I mean, to all our operations, science is a key, but we work uh, a lot in partnership with uh, actors um, and engagement also with society outside of academia. Uh, we work also as an academic partner to EAT, so we were the, the, we led the secretariat of the EAT Lancet Commission, for example, and last year we also launched the uh, Blue Food Assessment, that was a collaboration between um, Stockholm Resilience Center, Stanford University and EAT. Um, we were also key, uh, the, the key initiators be behind CBOS that was in the previous panel. And that whole process is quite interesting because it started as a more or less academic exercise of just trying to understand who are the keystone actors that today control most of the oceans and determine ocean health. And by just making a mapping of who are the largest players in the field, that was sort of an interesting scientific um, process in itself. But it's um, some of our researchers then took that forward and invited these uh, companies around the same table to really um, try to have a good dialogue on uh, how to affect change. We've also been involved in, in leading dialogue series about what does food system transformation mean in the Nordics, so together with the Nordic Council of Ministers to gather both academics and researchers from around the Nordics. So that's uh, some examples of the work that we do in this food space. Yeah. Thank you, Lina. I know that you are engaged in uh, research evidence also, Eivind. Would you say something about NOFIMA and your role? Yeah, NOFIMA is an applied research institute uh, with bases in uh, Norway. We work within the whole range of food production, mainly from uh, harvest till consumer, uh, and uh, work with uh, within the aquaculture industry, the whole value chain. We work within the uh, fishing industry and fishery uh, economics, and we work in the uh, food uh, land-based food value chain, uh, from uh, harvest and uh, post slaughter out to consumer science. Uh, we are not an uh, academic institution in the way that uh, the main goal is not the scientific papers per se, but it's the, to use the insight that we are getting uh, from uh, doing research and doing strategic research and implement those results into uh, action within the industry. So it's uh, more in the building the bridge between the pure academic research and the 
applied uh, within the industry, so the kind of uh, intermediate uh, part. We have, of course, worked very much uh, on sustainability since the UN came up with the SDGs some years back. Uh, and we have been on a journey from the kind of linear food approach to the circular and now more and more into uh, food systems thinking. We see that the food systems thinking is a kind of um, a challenge that it's uh, traditionally not encompassing the blue uh, food production. It's uh, mainly agri-food and we've been working very closely with the Norwegian Ministry uh, of the Trade Industries and Fisheries to get that uh, the blue food systems also up on the agenda. As uh, Semli said uh, previously, it's an important part of it. But uh, our vision, we have changed that over the years, so our vision is sustainable food for all, and our purpose is to provide excellent research and uh, innovations that can lead to improved sustainable food production and governance of resources from land and sea. So it's a kind of uh, encompassing the whole part. And in the new strategy, uh, we have been moving then from using this insight to see what is the response that we can do internally uh, to build a stronger sustainability context around what we do. And then uh, the effect that uh, we want to achieve in the industry with the research that we are providing. So it's mm -hmm. a kind of making a propel that is moving the sustainability upwards in society in a uh, different way. We will get back to some of the issues you have um, pointed out. And I, I, I would say thank you both. Um, I would like to follow up with some questions. And in your opinion, I would like to know what are the greatest challenges and barriers that we have that could ensure more sustainable food system? Lina, what do you think? I mean, there are multiple <laughs> challenges and barriers, obviously. I was just thinking that less than an hour ago, the press conference for the IPCC uh, Working Group 2 uh, report uh, started. Uh, the IPCC Working Group 2 report really looks at the human capacity for adaptation to climate change. Um, and I think the take home messages from this year's report is incredibly important. They say that climate change is hitting societies harder and faster than what we previously have known. And that many regions around the world are already locked into severe impacts that makes it really hard to sustain human well-being in these areas. And that's already with the warming we have now. And we are having even more climate change happening, right? Uh, the cumulative scientific evidence in, is unequivocal. Climate change is a threat to human well-being and planetary health. Any further delay in concerted global action will miss a brief and rapidly closing window of opportunity to secure a livable and sustainable future for all. This is our end sentence of this report, and I think it is quite stark of the enormous challenges we are facing. So what does this have to do with food? I mean, it, food is so central, both in terms of climate change mitigation, 25% of all the greenhouse gas emissions come from the food system. But food is also central in the way that we adapt to changing climates. Uh, this year's IPCC report also really puts the emphasis on the way we manage ecosystems, land, agriculture, as the way to also deal with this climate change. We know, and also from the work that we've done uh, previously, we know that food systems are this major driver behind multiple environmental impacts. It's, it's uh, greenhouse gas emissions, but it's also biodiversity loss, changes to the biogeochemical cycles, water use, et cetera. And this is, of course, the case globally, but it's also the case in the Nordics, where diets are also still a leading risk factor of poor health across all the, the whole region. And, this, uh, and the diets are causing environmental pre pressures, both territorially, but also external to our borders, as we also have, are we interlinked to a global system? But our research also shows that it is possible to feed uh, a healthy 
population. 10 billion people can be fed a healthy diet if we transition the food system. So this is just a scale of the challenge uh, that we're facing. I think most of the barriers are in understanding what are good pathways to a good food futures. And that even if we now start to see where we need to head, we really don't know where are the key leverage points in that uh, pathways that helps us achieve multiple goals, helps us achieve climate goals, goals on biodiversity, goals on poverty reduction, and uh, also a nutritious diet. So I think for us to sort of both as a scientific community and as a community in general, we need to be ensure that we have clear goals that are set and also understand the pathways to achieve these uh, goals. And that also to recognize that in these pathways, there will be uh, multiple trade-offs between different goals. So uh, some uh, things that are good for one might have problems for the other. Mm -hmm. So being more clear on how can we find tools that can assess these multiple interacting uh, dimensions. I think that's another really important sort of this is barrier or challenge. Yeah, and I know yeah. this is something you know, FEMA and Irvin also is um, mm. thinking about the, the food system and, and uh, as you said, the blue and the green. Irvin, what's your comment on this uh, area? I think Lean, uh, lean uh, uh, makes a very good uh, large uh, overview scale of the challenges which uh, you can say climate change and mm. environmental change, biodiversity loss, uh, food security, and nutritional uh, incapabilities or malnutrition uh, due to nutritional inefficiency, food safety, and then uh, last but not least, animal welfare. So that's uh, on the uh, big scale. One of the challenges for the food industry to become more um, uh, sustainable and the food systems is that it's so extremely interlinked mm -hmm. and that, uh, and that uh, understanding of these system connectivities, as you say, Lina, is one of the uh, where to put the drivers and where to put your efforts going forward is an enormous um, challenge. Mm -hmm. This is related both to the sectorial way of thinking that agriculture is separated from uh, marine foods, if you can say so, and the link between the two uh, is actually kind of two different worlds. Whereas uh, um, uh, Teresa Lugbergio in the previous said that uh, we are using uh, new protein sources from agriculture into feeding fish because aquaculture is necessary for uh, more sustainable food production from the oceans. So this interlinking and understanding that uh, part and to get the uh, transdisciplinary and cross uh, sectorial research activities up on the agenda is mm -hmm. one point. The second point is that uh, we have heard the role of the major companies, the large companies, and they are, of course, uh, you can mention everything from Nestle, Unilever, uh, Oricla, all of them have this on their agenda. Mm -hmm. However, if you take a look at the breakdown of this, uh, the food producing industry, it's much uh, more challenging to provide those industries, the smaller companies, the uh, uh, small to medium sized enterprises with a research based knowledge that is not hampering their business opportunity and their uh, drive towards a more sustainable production. And in this, you see that these companies don't have the financial resources to do the research on their own. And the government play an extreme role in supporting the financial resources necessary to do the transition mm -hmm. into higher uh, levels so that uh, the um, uh, food systems thinking and the food sustainable thinking trickles down even to the smallest producers. Uh, even to the subsistent uh, farmers, 
which is uh, um, uh, maybe we're not thinking of in Europe where we are well fed and uh, and overweight. But uh, if you take it on a global scale, it's uh, a major challenge is how do you actually see to it and which role does the governments play in providing sufficient financial support mm. to research-based initiatives mm. throughout the line to make the transition. I think that's a good um, way forward is that we need research-based solutions but we also need money to do the research that everyone has access to and we know that EU focus on uh, research and within the Green Deal and the Farm to Fork strategy for the sustainable food system. But if we focus on the Nordic countries, uh, where do the greatest opportunity for the industry and for the research, where do we find that if we just narrow it from the bigger picture to the Nordic picture? Eivind. Um. I, I think you have to go back to the, uh, you have to look at uh, what is happening and uh, with the primary production, uh, how do you make the primary production more sustainable, but you also have to look at the uh, logistics chain, uh, the transport reducing uh, single, uh, single use packaging material, you have to uh, look at uh, how do you contribute and make use of modern technologies like sensor technologies, automation to reduce environment, uh, environmental impact, but also the, uh, reduce energy loss. How can you use uh, smart sensors to uh, create modern production technology that actually encompasses? And how do you build new value chains that you enables the use of rest raw materials so that nothing is being lost. Today, it's uh, very few companies who have the ability to upgrade protein sources and protein is a key uh, challenge. So you have to build this kind of uh, stepwise uh, approach. But there is, uh, I mean, Nofima is a 400 people research organization. We are just a small wheel in the big machinery. But uh, having put this on the agenda that this is our contribution, this is how we can uh, contribute through our strategy. I think that is much more important that because we will then work with the industrial players in Norway and in the Nordics to say, what is on your agenda? How can we solve it? How can we contribute to solve it? And then uh, scale it from there. So, but yeah. I, I'm, uh, you, you won't get me to dig into one single area and say, uh, this is where we would put our uh, research. I say automation, I say the use of restaurant materials, I, enabling companies to uh, use our pilot plant to upgrade and so forth and so forth. But it's the field is so broad, uh, so I, I will not point out one single uh, area. No, I understand that it's it's a system we're talking about, so of course no. uh, it's a broader aspect. But uh, Lina, do you see the same as Eivind? Or do we have some advantages that we could take uh, advantage of or learn from other or vice versa? And in some ways, I agree that, that the solutions are both very diverse. It's not a single bullet solution. Um, and they are in some ways also similar in the Nordics to around, around the world. I don't think we are that unique that it's special here that it, in sense that we need to do something very different. So if we look at what we need to do, I completely agree with these value chain solutions that even also mentioned. I think those are extremely important. In addition, we need to look at the diets to define and understand what are sustainable diets. Um, and if we look at what we eat currently and why we need to be um, for a more both healthy and sustainable population, we would need to uh, increase consumptions of fruits, vegetables, whole grains, seeds and nuts and legumes. That's the general sort of pattern. Uh, and many cit citizens also consume too much sugar, salt, unhealthy fats, 
and then a need to reduce uh, consumption of red meat and processed meat. And I think that's uh, also very general with many other patterns around the world, but it's certainly true also in the Nordics. Uh, so looking at sort of dietary shifts are really important. Uh, and also how those shifts can happen for everyone, not just a particular part of the population, but how do we reach the most vulnerable groups also in society and where maybe this type of culture change are harder. Um, so diet's important. The other one is the production systems and that we also heard a little bit about before. And I would say uh, it's been talked about quite a bit in this um, uh, today, but the blue food sector, really important. And to uh, have a much more diverse also uh, blue food portfolio and looking how we can sort of eat lower down the food chain uh, in terms of of blue food. So what's the role of algae, mussels, uh, et cetera, and fish that is also lower down the food chain. Uh, the other thing is sort of uh, increasing investments also in healthy crops. Um, globally, and I'm not totally sure actually for the Nordics, but globally we've invested so much in agricultural development of just few, uh, four species, basically. It's soy, it's wheat, um, it's maize, um, and I'm blanking on the fourth, but it's very few rice. species. Rice, thank you. <laughs> uh, and we, we really need to eat much more of other grains and crops. And so we need to see the same type of agricultural development also taking place in other crops, and especially the crops that we need to increase production of and have more healthy for the population. I mean, I saw so, your hand, I guess. Yes. Uh, yep. Uh, it's a paradox if you uh, look at, because I fully agree with Lina on the, uh, this uh, monospecies uh, kind of agriculture that we are doing, that we're using 77% of the land area available for producing animal proteins. Uh, and um, then we heard about the uh, bio de uh, degradation of the agricultural land, which is approximately 50% of what is on the uh, earth. But the paradox is that if you look at uh, sustainability under a, as a big and major challenge, the food industry in a report given out by the food, uh, the food industries Europe in uh, 2018, stated that 0.27% of revenues from the food industry is spent on R&D. But we are responsible for one third of the uh, greenhouse gas emissions and the challenge. And we are, uh, so to say, an extremely important player in both the uh, social uh, sustainability uh, parameter and in the economic uh, sustainability parameter. But when it comes to the uh, environmental uh, part, I don't think we are stepping up to where we need to be and should be. If mm -hmm. you look at the car industry spending 5% on uh, R&D, the pharmaceutical industry 13, 14% the biotech uh, technology industry, even more. And you can say, yes, these are uh, tools coming and benefiting the food producing industry in the long term. But in overall, if we have a major challenge, uh, there should be uh, a higher public spending and a higher private spending on mm -hmm. R&D in general, since that's the topic of what we're talking about. <laughs> that will take me um, back to uh, one of the questions I have been thinking about this weekend, and uh, it's the collaboration. Uh, how should business and research institutions work together to ensure better food system? Because that's some of the things that you actually address, Eivind, is that we need to work together, we have to step up, and also uh, the R&D spending on this issue. Um, Eivind, do you want to start? or? Yeah, I think the important part is that uh, since this is a major concern to uh, society, it's, uh, we have to move away from research for the sake of research. Mm -hmm. uh, and at least we have to have some uh, groups that are working on the long-term sustainability issues and doing the mapping and the challenges. But then we have to have some uh, players, applied players, who are able to translate th this into action. 
and this uh, part, uh, and I do, don't think it's just asking the industry for more money, but it's more also for the uh, research organizations and for the industry to see that there are science-based knowledge out there that they can tap into to mm -hmm. solve their problems. And instead of sitting in their uh, kind of um, part and uh, think that uh, product line extension is then uh, is our way of doing R and D. There might be some more fundamental changes and shifts that are necessary. Mm -hmm. Lina, I think that's really important. I I also think that it's very important to work on different tools uh, and different mod modeling approaches that can assess um, where are the important leverage points, where are the important trade-offs between multiple different goals, etc. And in that work, I think both the business sector sit on so much data that they also could uh, make available for research and uh, make available for, for different type of um, uh, modeling assessment, as well as a scientific community also sitting on really good data as well as really good tools. So I see there are lots of opportunities for collaboration on sharing data, on working together to really deepen the understanding of, of how we can uh, move forward and where are the biggest leverage points. So, um, yeah, and I think uh, the other thing is that there is a lot of demand for partnership and interdisciplinary collaboration. So also finding ways of how do we make these collaborations effective and smart? Where can we really pool our resources um, so that we make the largest sort of leaps uh, forward together? I think that's another important thing. And maybe also just end that when we did this dialogue series across the Nordic countries, there was a massive um, interest in, I think everyone agreed we need to see a shift in the food system. So that there was a general consensus there, but also a, a, an ask for better and deeper collaborations between the different countries. So uh, we see that interest existing today and we, it's just about sort of how we move it forward. But that also wrap up a good thing in the Nordic countries is that we trust each other. We are at least friendly against each other. Uh, and we p have this uh, strengthened that the mo Nordic model could actually be something that could take us further on into the food system. Uh, our time mm. is nearly there. But finally, if you would give one last advice, what would that be to get further or closer into a sustainable food system? Lina. Well, I think I think one last advice is that I am convinced that, uh, that a, uh, a sustainable future uh, food future can be both attractive and tasty and available for all. So I think this is just we should see this as an opportunity space of how we really make big leaps in progress for a better um, better welfare for all of us. So that's maybe the last uh, point. Maybe. Uh, I think uh, build on the collaborative uh, efforts that we have in, the, uh, in this and keep talking about the importance of sustainability, uh, food production, and try to translate it down to something that people understand instead of uh, putting and use all these uh, uh, kind of wooden words uh, that nobody understands, but uh, bring it down and translate it into a uh, simple language that is uh, understandable to everybody. Thank you so much, Eivin and Linne, to uh, have this talk. Uh, thank you. And I will give the floor to the next moderator, which is Kim Gabrielli from U thank UN you. Compact. Thank you very much uh, for that. And I'm looking forward to an exciting uh, exciting panel here now. Um, we are going to discuss, like we just said, we heard we need, we need to see a shift in the food system, just like Lina ended up the, the last session. And, and I think there are several reasons for that. Uh, we I talked about uh, IPCC, uh, IPVC um, um, report earlier today, and 
now we got some more results from it uh, and it says of course that um, uh, the, the climate change will challenge food, food security in the whole world in and in our continent uh, and it also says very clearly that we will see uh, food uh, loss in food production due to tempor uh, temperature rise and of course droughts. And these are some of the, the questions we are going to discuss today with Gunnel Stordalen from EAT. Welcome to you. Uh, and of course Anne-Marit Panningstun from uh, Nortura. Uh, we are going to focus on, uh, on the dilemmas uh, and opportunities together in a dialogue-based approach. Um, and I think I'm going to start there, Anne-Marit. Um, could you pick out some of the dilemmas you see uh, in the food system these days and how that looks like from, from you? You're representing uh, many, many farmers, uh, 18,000, I think, around Norway, right? Yeah, that's right. Thank you. Uh, we have already heard today that uh, the global uh, challenge or the global dilemma is uh, uh, the growing uh, world population peaking to 9 to 10 billion in 2050 and uh, with an estimated need uh, to increase global food production with 70 percent meet uh, to meet the uh, future demands uh, and at the same time our food systems are under pressure from the impact of climate changes resulting of droughts fluids uh, rising sea levels threatening lower uh, coastal areas where currently 10% of global food is being produced. So uh, we urgently need to understand how we can produce uh, more food uh, for growing population, but uh, with less resources. Uh, and of course, to take uh, care of natural resources, particular soils and fresh water, and uh, that will not contribute to climate change. And of course, also protect uh, the natural environment around us. So. Uh, this we all agree on and uh, every country and every pro uh, food pro uh, producing company must take responsibility for this, uh, which we in Nortura promise uh, to do, of course. I'm gonna... So when we look to, uh, to the Norwegian uh, agriculture production, uh, that's uh, quite different uh, from how food is produced in most other countries. Uh, briefly explain, as you said, uh, there are a lot of small, uh, small scale family owned farmers. Uh, we are owned by 7,000, uh, 17,000 of them. Uh, and that's quite similar also to Sweden and Denmark, where they also have, uh, where we have sister organizations uh, like this. And, uh, and especially is also that the farmers, they own the means of production that means also the production facilities and the industry um so I... now uh, as in any other uh, other industry uh, there are dilemmas and i will like to point out three of them that we see in uh, particularly in uh, in norway uh, the first one is uh, to producing more food uh, on our own resources, as already mentioned earlier today. Uh, but of course, uh, also the recent event in Ukraine and the global pandemic, uh, pandemic over two years uh, underscored the critical importance of national food self-sufficiency. Um, that means that we need to stop using other countries' resources to produce food for our population, uh, but also for our animals. Um, and we need to maintain the high level of protein self-sufficiency where we are today and increase the production of vegetables at the same time. Anna Marit, so I'm gonna, therefore, I'm going to yeah. stop you there now so we can uh, bring in Gunnel as well, and then we're going to have yeah. uh, back, back and forward, so I will come back to you. And, and Gunnel, does it look the same from your side? I mean, there's a lot of dilemmas, as you know, when we look at, as we heard earlier today, the when we look at the food system as a whole and we not look at, you know, individual pieces, but we're trying to see the holistic uh, picture. How, how, what are the dilemmas you would point to? Do you agree with Anna Marit here? Thanks, Kim. Uh, yeah, I, I really agree with uh, Anna Marit to uh, at least a certain extent here. Um, in my view, the, the biggest challenge uh, we are facing right now is that we as a society, meaning governments and the food industry and the public uh, in general, that we are not really 
listening to what the facts or what the science are literally screaming at us because we we now know we have overwhelming evidence that we fundamentally have to transform both food production and food consumption and obviously also make food systems much more efficient uh, reducing food loss and waste by at least uh, 50 percent by 2030 and in the addition to what Anna Marit mentioned we are not yet recognizing as society that food systems have to go from being one of the biggest emitters emitting one third of the global emissions to become net carbon sinks by 2050 storing massive amounts of carbon in the soil at the same time as we have heard food systems have to become much more resilient to climate change and shocks and stresses and at the same time we need to produce more food for more people in a way that keeps them healthy uh, not malnourished uh, as uh, today where, where more than 50 percent of the population is malnourished if we combine all the different forms of malnutrition uh, and what is most scary, uh, and I think we are not yet talking enough about this, is that current climate models uh, for staying within 1.5 or even 2 degree um, Celsius actually assume that this successful food system transformation is underway and will happen. But we don't have any policies, any plans, any targets, no net zero equivalent for uh, food systems um, perhaps with an exception uh, of the visions laid out in the eu farm to fork and as i uh, heard in the in the science panel lena gordon uh, referred to important trade-offs absolutely there will be important trade-offs that we have to consider and of course minimize but science overall is painting a very optimistic and uh, a picture of massive opportunities and win-wins for health, for climate, for environment, for social equity and farmers' livelihoods, uh, and also in terms of reducing uh, pandemics risks. So to, uh, to, to really get back to your initial question, I think the, the biggest uh, dilemma here is really the lack of political understanding and the lack of political commitments, because we know that policy is the most important and the strongest lever here. And we are in a situation where we are focusing on the wrong things. Uh, we have had hundreds of press conferences on the pandemic uh, here in Norway. We don't have any press conferences on climate or the massive food system transformation that we have to undertake over the next eight years. I guess we're looking forward to the government having a, a, a press release on today, throughout this afternoon, to talk about climate and food systems. But I guess that will not have happened, at least not in uh, today. Um, but coming back to you, uh, Anmarit, now we heard both some of the uh, like topic uh, topics that are challenging us, like food security and the need for uh, more production with less resources. We heard Gunil saying the policy. But but just to get an idea, when you're saying, uh, Anmarit, that Nortura should be the most sustainable food producer in Norway, how, how do you ensure that? Because there are criticism about um, about meat production. Uh, and you've gotten this question many times befo before, but I'm sure you are the whole time uh, developing, you know, your thoughts and uh, and how do you do you, you answer that uh, dilemma? I mean, how, how how does it look like? How, how are you going to be the the sustainable food producer? Yeah, I can understand that this uh, seems uh, quite ambitious, uh, but I'm quite confident uh, that uh, this could be reachable. Uh, Nortura's business model is based on sustainability. Uh, sustainability is actually a core of our business. To bring uh, the farm and the surroundings, like the nature around the farm, uh, in better conditions to the next generation is actually our heritage uh, in, the, in the company and in the prime production. So, but of course, uh, there is a lot uh, to be done uh, to be there. Uh, as um, most people probably know that we uh, are owned by small scale family driven farmers, as I said, and, and we really believe that small size and distributed farming is more sustainable than large enterprises. Uh, 
uh, and industrialized uh, farms. And this model delivers better uh, food safety, higher uh, resilience against animal diseases. Uh, we have lower use of antibiotics and better welfare than most other uh, uh, meat and egg producers. So here we need to work close to Norwegian politicians to, so we can continue with small size and distributed farms also in the future. And that was also one of my, my dilemmas that I, I was attending to bring to the, to the table that are we really want or do the, uh, do the people really want to pay for small scale um, farmers and full uh, scale productions? That's one of the dilemmas as, as uh, Let me pick yeah, up on, as uh, upon that because um, the other day I saw you were posting in your social media, uh, Gunil, that y and you said the only way to create a system that respect and honors our farmers promotes animal um, welfare, health, garbage storage, biodiversity, and ensure quality food. Um, we need to have a holistic strategy. I think we all agree on that. But now we are going into the, let's say, the more difficult uh, part of the discussion where, where we have to talk about what does a holistic, you know, Anna Marit is talking about it now, small, f um, small scale farmers could be one component it has surely other components. So, so what, where, where, where would you start to define that holistic structure because uh, uh, and strategy? Because we see that there are, like you said yourself, there are many that are now setting high goals, uh, but the challenging part is the transition. So how do we ensure the concrete measures to, um, to reach that holistic structure, holistic strategy? So I would I would actually start with I mean the reason we are in this food systems mess where food are driving some of the biggest global uh, and also national problems and and uh, hindering uh, progress towards the sustainable development goals and Paris is because we have been thinking about food in silos uh, the government has not been seeing the big picture around food and hence this has been uh, uh, or the policies today are completely uh, contradictory and there is there is uh, not possible to deliver on the multiple outcomes that food systems need to deliver on so uh, what we need is obviously this holistic cross-sectoral strategy and action plans with clear science-based targets and this has to be developed across different ministries uh, and departments and uh, we need that strategy also to be integrated in uh, our national climate actions, uh, countries and disease, um, so-called NDCs. Uh, food has to be a key part of those, which are not yet the so, uh, the uh, case today. So are you and saying, the, just, just to clarify, are, are you saying that uh, there is no national strategy, food strategy in Norway today? There is no national food systems strategy. Uh, and what is even more embarrassing, Kim, uh, as a result of the first UN Food System Summit that took place in September last year, where the Norwegian government under the former uh, uh, government was highly engaged, uh, as a result of this summit, more, more than 120 countries have now embarked on developing their national food systems strategies. Unfortunately, and, and, and embarrassingly, Norway is not amongst those countries. So that work of uh, starting that strategy has now been parked by the current governments. Uh, and as we have been pushing for as EAT is that we absolutely need to develop such a strategy uh, as every other country on the planet. But we also need to do that on the best available science. So what Norway and any other country uh, need to do is really to to make or undertake a national Eat Lancet IP, IPCC type of analysis, assessing how can we optimize food production from a land and the ocean in a way that stores carbon in the soil, that restores biodiversity, that as far as possible deliver on the nutritional needs from, for the population, increasing self-sufficiency as uh, Anna Marit is, is saying, 
And then we need to obviously address the trade-offs to uh, and and develop uh, the strategy to to really leverage the entire policy toolbox. And that is absolutely doable, but there is no political will. So we need to push for it. And I guess on the matter that we we would both. Uh, say that we need such a strategy so and and, and the final point is that <laughs> farmers of course need to be at the center of this transition because although you are painting a very uh, pink picture and a nice picture here on the market farmers today are are losing out uh, two farms are shut down every day and uh, farmers are forced to industrialize and they are forced to more efficiency which not is not compatible with animal welfare, sustainability, okay, gonna public health. I'm going to let on the mic. It's a bit difficult to stop you when we are digitally, but uh, I'm just trying to get uh, on the mic in now. So how do you respond to that on the mic? I mean, there is... There yeah, I, I very much agree on having a national strategy and uh, develop this together uh, from, from the Norwegian conditions that we uh, have both in uh, in farming and, and food production. And uh, of course, uh, based uh, this on science targets, so sci science, that's uh, also what we what we aim for. Uh, and I also want to um, emphasize that we have to, to balance all the sustainable objectives, not only climate, but you have to balance all this out. As Gunnar also said, uh, store, uh, emissions stub back to the earth, uh, back to the soil, uh, and so on. And also to um, to use uh, methane uh, to capture that and to use it for renewable energy. That's uh, one of the uh, part that we also work with uh, or and also could put into such a strategy. So we might, can I ask yeah. you, so are there differences between the Nordic uh, farming traditions? Uh, beca because we are in, in a Nordic talk, so I will ask the question to Gunnel afterwards how she sees it as well from a more policy. Uh, but how does it look from the from you? Are you different than the Swedes and, and the Danes? Of, of course, there are there are many simil similarities, and and of course uh, to have a cooperation on the policy area, uh, we very much support, and uh, that's needed. Uh, and we also use uh, a lot of competence knowledge uh, across the Nordics. Uh, but when it comes to, for, for instance, uh, soil quality, that differs uh, a lot. Uh, when you look to Denmark, uh, I suppose they are all, uh, already planning and preparation for, for uh, suing that uh, today. But we are skiing on the farmland right now, and we will do that for two, three months still. So, of course, there is a lot of uh, differences as well. Uh, Gunnel, what, what do you think? Uh, have the other Nordic countries uh, created, a, like you said, a holistic national strategy on food? Or are they just uh, lagging behind us as Norway, as you said? So some of them have uh, started um, during the UN Food System Summit, where uh, EAT and I were leading on action track two on shifting to sustainable uh, and healthy consumption patterns. Especially Denmark and Sweden were very active. Uh, as a result, Sweden have now just, no, sorry, Denmark has just updated their uh, dietary di guidelines, uh, including um, reducing the recommendations for uh, red meat. They have now a limit on 350 grams per week. Uh, they are encouraging more legumes, uh, so beans and uh, lentils, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and Denmark is also one of the first countries, as far as I'm aware of, that has set binding targets for the agricultural and forest sector to uh, reduce a 55 to 65% by 2030. Uh, Finland has also just updated their the, uh, dietary guidelines. Uh, and they are really more, these countries are more advanced, uh, unfortunately, than Norway uh, in this regard. And uh, I think we... Stugunik, can you hear us? Hopefully, then Stugunik will soon in very. Uh, and oh. our Nordic uh, or our uh, EU members uh, and neighbors also could really push for uh, for changes in EU uh, and obviously trying to get the farm to fork strategy to 
to be implemented to a, a larger extent than what's the case today. And on, uh, on the market, where, where do you see that? We already talked a bit. Where, where You're on you mute, Kim. Okay, can you hear me now? Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm now I will unmute myself again. Uh, so, uh, do you on, on the market, where, where do you see that you can agree with it? Because there has been so much focus on on you know how farmers and eat and other um, organizations do not agree, but I think we ov obviously we agree on the, the the end goal to have a sustainable food system that uh, delivers food to everyone uh, at a sustainable and healthy way. But where do you see that you you agree? What what do you where we could you sit down together with Gunil and and you know lay down the the framework going forward? Uh, I really believe that uh, we can agree on several policy issues. Uh, we talked about uh, the national strategy, uh, and. Uh, uh, it's uh, obvious that uh, the view on role of meat in the uh, daily diet is uh, something that's different, but uh, uh, that food must be both healthy and sustainable. I think we uh, could agree on uh, that the food system and national production of food and feed must be based on the natural land resources uh, for a country that uh, uh, it seems like we are agreed on uh, during the talk. Uh, and of course, protect the diversity of nature and integrity of uh, life on Earth. And all in all, it's a, it's a lot of things that uh, I think we, uh, we could agree on uh, in such a strategy. And all in all, we hope to prove that we are able to cut uh, emissions such as uh, in such scales that uh, we will not uh, need to cut production of meat, uh, but can produce healthy and sustainable meat uh, also for the future in Norway. Hey Gunil, what is your take on this? Uh, oh, I, I mean, I think we agree on a lot, uh, Anna Maritz, uh, and and especially on the on the policy levers here. Um, what I what I really do think we we should uh, follow up and and have a discussion on is. Uh, is how can we also push collectively for for the governments to to develop this uh, national uh, food systems strategy, where everything from agricultural subsidies, public procurement, labeling, um, uh, fiscal policies, all of the policy policy uh, tools are working together and not against each other as today towards multiple objectives which we agree is public health climates biodiversity uh, animal health welfare and last but not least farmers livelihoods because we need a massive investment in the agricultural sector and we need to incentivize and pay farmers for the critical work they are doing uh, and we need to pay them for ecosystems services and animal health and welfare uh, which is not the case today so so i think we we should really uh, uh, work together and we also need to keep in mind that when we talk about what healthy uh, and sustainable and resilient look like in the Nordic or the Norwegian context, it has to be based on a national Eat Lancet IPCC type of assessment. Because today we have just ended up with uh, um, a lot of meat production uh, and a lot of meat import uh, without really asking the question, how can we optimize uh, our, our production. But it goes without saying that in a country with 3% arable land, uh, livestock, grazing livestock will play a critical role. Uh, so, so the goats, the, the sheep, the cow will play a really important uh, role in a healthy, sustainable uh, food systems and a healthy, sustainable diets in, in Norway. But the question is the nuances uh, over. So, so yeah, I'm and I, I like to add that. and. And then we really need to have the national stat strategy because this is quite different from, or the differs from uh, almost uh, any country in, uh, uh, in the world, also the Nordics. So we really need a national strategy for that. Can we team up on the market and, and push the governments and Sandra Borg for getting this uh, work started uh, tomorrow? Absolutely. Okay, that sounds we like a good that. idea. I was just going to propose uh, Something like <laughs> that, uh, and also perhaps we can look at the assessment you were talking about, Gunil. Perhaps it's possible to do that together. 
Uh, it's a very interesting not, not together because the sign as so this this has to be absolutely independent from any uh, um, private sector interests so uh, what we should do is to get the Norwegian research institutions uh, from um, uh, half Institute uh, to uh, uh, Nibiu to all the different university uh, groups uh, in Norway that are working on bits and pieces of the issues to come together and undertake this. Uh, and then we should meet and discuss how do we get towards an optimal uh, scenario? What are the policy levers? How can private sector play a role? How can civil society come together and support it? So let's keep that thought and try to take it forward. So it's not only stays as a thought, but as some action, as we know that when we are moving from setting goals into action we need to move from data to real transition uh, and this is also what we have been trying to do with setting up a global are about to setting up a global coalition of food uh, actors in the UN global compact system we have already uh, many of our local networks uh, on board together with us from brazil um, colombia uh, france denmark and others so if you are interested in that, that will there will be a lot of focus and uh, news coming out on that topic. We have got funding already from Lloyd's Register Foundation to, to start up that work. Uh, thank you so much to Gunnar and Anna Marit from EAT and uh, Nortura. Uh, looking forward to continue this discussion and make sure that we get into to action very soon. Sounds like a plan. Thank you so much. Thank you thank all you. for you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Then we are going to pass on to our next panel, uh, and I will uh, invite up to the stage uh, uh, Heidi Finskos from uh, KLP. Welcome to you. You will moderate the next, next panel. Thank you so much, Kim, and thank you for putting this important uh, topic on the agenda. The science is uh, clear. The we have a planetary emergency in front of us due to the loss of nature and biodiversity. Um, and the finance sector has also awakened because this will impact countries, it will impact economies and businesses. But who can actually do something about it? Is it up to the policymakers or is it also a role for finance to play uh, in this? These are the topics uh, that we will discuss during the final panel session uh, this afternoon. Uh, I'm pleased to introduce you to an eminent uh, panel uh, we have Jan Erik Saugestad from uh, his uh, CEO of Store Brand Asset Management, uh, which is one of the uh, investors that uh, that is engaging on the topic uh, for their global investment portfolio. Um, welcome also to Jens Henriksson, uh, CEO of Swedbank, a Swedish bank with a, which has a market presence in the Nordics and and the Balticum, and also have uh, strong roots in the agricultural sector. And finally, uh, welcome also to uh, Akansha Katri uh, from the World Economic Forum, uh, where you're heading uh, the nature uh, work. Uh, for instance, you're now planning a series of reports uh, on the topic, um, which will set up the business case uh, for uh, biodiversity and uh, safeguarding uh, nature. Welcome to all of you. First, let, you. Me <laughs> let me start with you, uh, Jan Erik. It took decades uh, to come to the point where we are now, uh, where most of the finance sector actually talks and, and acts on, on climate change. Um, the discussion about nature and biodiversity, it, uh, that started much later, uh, but still it has matured and become more mainstream in a much shorter period of uh, time. That's at least my ex impression. Well, what's your view on that and, and how come? Well, um, you know, one of the encouraging elements of COP26 was actually that nature was put <coughs> uh, into uh, the context of climate change. And nature-based solutions um, uh, became part of the climate uh, action. Uh, of course, nature has a much wider context also when we look at biodiversity loss. Um, and companies dependency or economies dependency on nature um, and I think um, uh, the reason why this is now moving maybe faster than what we saw 
when we talk about climate change is, of course, that we are we have frameworks and institutions that now have, uh, if you like, practice on the climate challenge. Uh, you know how to set the ambitions, how to follow up on ambitions, how to establish a framework to get more data, uh, and also how to start establishing uh, regulation that could uh, propel and, and accelerate the, the development. So I'm very, if you like, uh, optimistic from that perspective, but very much like climate, we are, um, you know, um, we are behind the schedule. Uh, we've already experienced a significant biodiversity loss uh, and uh, significant uh, damage to nature. Uh, Jan Erik talked about the importance of frameworks and and also that regulation is, is starting to come to come. Um, but Jens, uh, from your point of view, why do you think that it's important for finance uh, for the finance sector to uh, have biodiversity and nature on the agenda? And what what is what made you uh, to put it on your India uh, your oh, agenda? Okay. What created your interest in in this topic? Well, thank you very much for that good question. Thank you very much for inviting me. I would say that if you look at Swedbank, we have a 200 year history and one of our big parts that we played in Swedish uh, societies that we've been very large in both forest and agriculture. And this coincides very much with uh, the discussion that's ongoing right now. But I think Jan Erik said it very eloquently and very well. And the key point now is that we need to make sure that we have the, uh, the frameworks and the procedures so we can work with that. And that could be a problem because if you look on the task force, or if you look on the climate, it's so easy to measure uh, the carbon dioxide in uh, the air uh, or measure the degree. But how do you really measure biodiversity? because biodiversity is something that we meet in everyday life. If we go up to the mountains, if we uh, live, uh, go out for a walk in the city or outside the city. So I think what's happening now with the task force for nature related financial disclosures is a, a step forward. But uh, let's realize it will be a bit more difficult than when it comes to TCFD. Akansha, uh, both Jens and Jare Erik, uh, he says well, it's important to measure uh, the loss of biodiversity and uh, well, put pretty good, great trust into these frameworks, uh, actually. What, what's your view on that? Um, I, I would absolutely second uh, what has been said so far, particularly the last point that uh, was made is that we have to learn to be comfortable that biodiversity is going to be complex. It is not going to be as simple uh, as climate change because you do not have that one single metric you may have a single goal of being nature positive but eventually that goal needs to be broken down because biodiversity is uh, comprising of everything uh, but i do have confidence in initiatives such as the tnfd uh, such as the science-based targets for nature similar to the sbti's which were done for climate uh, and increasingly to see more and more businesses, both on the finance investors and corporate side, starting to look at how nature and biodiversity can be incorporated into their risk profile and risk mitigation strategy uh, definitely gives me more confidence that it's doable. Sounds good. Okay, so let's dig deeper then into the role of finance. What is it that we as investors, we as banks, actually can do uh, things that actually have an impact uh, on, on nature and biodiversity, especially when it comes to the food system. Jan Erik, you first, please. Yeah, um, you know, we, we've said many times that, um, you know, the importance of actually um, financial sector or, or investors, uh, governments and corporates being able to work together in a coordinated fashion is, it <coughs> is, is really impactful. And I, and I think this is very true in many cases. Um, of course, um, uh, also when we talk about uh, biodiversity and nature. Uh, but I want to highlight maybe three elements that I believe is, is 
you know, where financial institutions really can um, help. Uh, one is, of course, um, in, in terms of uh, risk assessment. Um, uh, for instance, agriculture remains one of the main drivers for deforestation. Um, and uh, we are deploying two different tools, the Forest 500 and, and Trace, um, to help us monitor um, deforestation. And, and based on that, we have identified over 50 companies with a high deforestation risk. So just one example of how we could contribute to better insight in, in uh, the risk of companies. Uh, of course, you have the TNFD uh, uh, and the contribution the finance sector can do uh, to that framework in terms of both understanding the dependency, uh, but also the negative uh, impact certain companies uh, might have. And then the other element is uh, financial institutions can play a major role as capital owners uh, or asset managers um, through engagement. Um, you know, that has been effective uh, when we look at uh, the climate uh, battle. Uh, and one of the largest alliances now is the Climate Action 100 Plus. Um, we are, are currently, uh, currently there is no good engagement platform for investors to systematically engage on biodiversity. Um, but uh, over the past years, we've been working with a small group of investors to uh, establish a Nature Action 100. Uh, what that what will do you mean be with a, what, what an do you mean with a good platform for engagement, Jan-Erik? Hmm? What do you mean with a good platform for engagement? What is lacking? Well, a good platform for, for engagement is, is a platform where we can, uh, you know, we can share experiences. Uh, we can uh, work together uh, on specific company cases. Uh, it makes it easier for the company to relate to us as investors instead of each one of us individually. Uh, and we could also, um, uh, uh, through uh, alliances like that, um, um, also you know, uh, share uh, data and, and uh, support development of data services. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's both to, to make it easier for the company, it's to make it more impactful uh, when we walk with our feet, if you like, mm -hmm. uh, or rather uh, try to influence the companies uh, and also to, to bring uh, more resources to the table to do research. I, I very much agree with that. Those types of platforms make the, the work of investors much more efficient in, in so many ways. And we've, have you also mentioned that we've done that to some extent on, on, on climate. So we just need to establish one in, for, for nature and biodiversity then. Is that your message? Well, it, it, as I said, we, we, we're actually, we have, uh, we're at the brink of, of launching that uh, Nature 100 uh, plus alliance, uh, which uh, some institutions have been working on now for actually a couple of years. Mm. Uh, Jens, what, what do you think that Swedbank and uh, other banks uh, are able to do to bring about change? Well, thank you, Heidi. Let me be totally open and frank. I do not sit here because I'm a biologist. I do not sit here because I like to walk in the forest or uh, see birds and animal life and have a biodiversity. Uh, I do that, of course, but I do it because I'm here to make money. Uh, I'm a, a sort of, I run a bank and what we want to do is we want to be a part of the transformation. We think it's, uh, we can make a lot of money on being there. Uh, for our customers to help them tra to transform into uh, uh, sustainable business models. And we know that if we lend out money to companies that destroy the biodiversity, that go against the nature, we won't get the money back. Uh, and uh, so for me, and I'm quoting here Larry Fink, who wrote, we are here because it's sustainable business. That's the key point. The other things are good, but that's not the key why we're here. Mm -hmm. 
And how can you influence then uh, your customers or a sector? What, what do you think would be your main uh, action points from for a bank uh, to to push well, this transformation? I'll give you a few examples. Let me start on the climate because it's a bit easier. So we decided a little while ago to stop financing new prospectations of new oil fields. We stopped uh, uh, financing uh, um, unconventional uh, gas and oil production. We have stopped to finance companies with too much coal in them. We have stopped to finance the building of uh, new uh, oil uh, boats, things like that. Uh, why do we do that? Well, we do it because we do not think we'll get the money back. The same thing we can do with agriculture. We can uh, put demand on them to say that this is what you, you should do. Uh, otherwise, we won't lend out money uh, to them. And that means that we can make a little bit more money and not lose on bad investments because people won't buy uh, products that are not made in a way that's good uh, for biodiversity. Mm. Jan Erik mentioned um, that it's important to, to raise the awareness and, and, and uh, share insights uh, when it comes to risk profiles of companies. I, is that valuable for, for you and your customers, Jens? Yes, of course. We, we look in many ways. And uh, one of the ways, will, of course, will be through the taxonomy that the EU has decided. And never underestimate the strength of 3,000 bureaucrats in Brussels. They can change the world as they've done with GDPR. So that means things like that will have an impact. And we want to be there. We want to help our uh, agricultures to, to make sure that their uh, farming is done in a way that's good for nature. We want to be a part of the financing the forestry industry so we can build really cool stuff to take away the fossil fuels and stuff like that. We want to be a part of it to make money. Mm. You mentioned the EU taxonomy. That's, of course, very important. I mean, the EU taxonomy, that's EU's definition of what, is, um, what kind of activities that can be called sustainable uh, going forward. Um, part of EU taxonomy is, is also biodiversity. Um, and most sectors have now got their own uh, criteria for uh, nature and biodiversity. Uh, Akansha, in, in your view, uh, how important will the EU taxonomy be in order to safeguard nature? Huge, I think. Um, I, I think if I even just look at it globally, um, you don't have a parallel such as the EU taxonomy. Um, so the fact that EU is working through it um, and does not have it perfect, um, I think there are still a couple of things that need to be ironed out, uh, but it is a signal. Um, I think in just the last year, the number of uh, companies, particularly the finance sector, uh, that has gotten interested in the topic of biodiversity, I feel is triggered by the EU taxonomy. Um, so that for me is absolutely a game changer. I couldn't agree more with what was said earlier, is the power of policy uh, to actually signal where the level playing field should be for business. Because I think what has happened in carbon, there was a huge amount of momentum when it came to the voluntary market. And then you had obviously a huge push uh, from the uh, regulatory side as well. And we just need to be able to do that same momentum on steroids because we don't have time. Um, so when we are talking about risks, um, I, I think in, since so much of the discussion today is on, on the food system, uh, and uh, Janarik and Jens talked about deforestation. So that's definitely one of the drivers of nature loss. But if you look at opportunities, there's also making sure that our soils stay healthy. So a new business opportunity where we need to see more investors and um, corporates and financiers actually get into action is on regenerative agriculture. So the EU taxonomy along with the farm to fork strategy is a, uh, it, it's a great signal, uh, but we still need financiers and investors to be able to finance that transition because the farmer income today is just so low that they cannot absorb the transition cost that is required. And already, uh, we globally, uh, around 50 to 52 to 53 percent of global soil is actually degraded in terms of those hierarchy of uh, high, medium, and low quality. 52 percent is considered medium and low quality. Uh, so both for our food security, biodiversity, and as Jens said, to making sure um, the businesses stay resilient and profitable 10 years from now, we need to start investing in this. Mm. 
Jan Erik, uh, Jens, he mentioned stop financing um, sectors or certain activities um, uh, as one tool for investors. Uh, Akansha, you mentioned we need to finance the new solutions. What's your take, uh, Jan Erik? Uh, we, uh, we're in this spectrum, uh, or somewhere in, in the middle, do you think that the, the influence of investors is the greatest? Well, I, I think uh, generally when we talk about sustainable uh, investments, there are always these three levers. Uh, one is, uh, of course, uh, businesses that uh, are, are negative, and in this case then would have a significant negative impact on nature. We need to uh, divest from them. We need to challenge them um, and, uh, for that matter, raise the cost of capital for them. Um, then you have the, the tool of engagement, uh, and I refer to uh, now the successful engagement platforms on climate, and that we're now building that um, for nature. Uh, but it's also not only engagement platforms for companies, uh, but it's also engagement platforms with governments. And um, you know, we, we have this initiative now both in Brazil, Indonesia, and also on user countries uh, that will address deforestation and, and you know, have, have a dialogue with government. And then, of course, uh, as, as it was referred to, uh, uh, you know, how can we fund, uh, whether it's uh, green solutions uh, uh, to combat climate or, or uh, new uh, ways of, of working uh, that give better uh, have less impact and better uh, efficiency when it comes to, for that matter, food production. Um, and I would also add, maybe, to to this, that, you know, the E and the S and the G are, are often, you know, interacting. Um, so the, we also have in initiatives like um, minimum living wage. And, of course, when you speak about farmers, and their ability to basically move into maybe more sustainable farming or farming the right crops. Um, you know, the living wage uh, problem and the social dimension is, is certainly key to resolve. Mm -hmm. Let, let's get back to the engagement that you, you, you mentioned as important for, for investors. Engagement meaning dialogue with companies uh, in order to influence their practices. Uh, Jan Erik, you, you've been doing that a lot uh, in, in Storebrand as well. Um, could you perhaps share some lessons learned when it comes to engagement, uh, especially when it comes to nature? What, what, mm. what, what works and what doesn't work or is not as efficient? Um, as nice? mm. Well, I, I mean, that's, uh, they're, they're very individual cases. Uh, we have identified um, uh, when, we, when we talk about nature, we have identified now 50 companies, uh, including banks, uh, which we are in dialogue with, uh, particularly on the issue of agricultural land and deforestation. Um, and um, I think, at least according to Financial Times, we're the first uh, uh, manager now to really put some of the soy traders on uh, the observation list. What does that mean? It means that unless we get these companies, and this is uh, Bungie and ADM, actually to implement uh, both long-term and short-term ambitions on how they're going to uh, uh, make their soy production deforestation-free, uh, we will divest. So I think it's always the, the, the carrot and the stick uh, in these dialogues. Uh, we try to stay invested as long as possible, uh, and we communicate that clearly to the company. But it, at the same time, if there is no willingness to acknowledge the problem, or if there is no willingness to set any ambitions uh, in the reasonable time frame that most <laughs> uh, well, uh, the professionals have, i.e. in the next five years or maybe even ten, well, then uh, it, it, it becomes, um, you know, hot air. Mm -hmm. Jens, do you have any examples from, from your portfolio or from your engagement where you 
where you've been positively surprised or seen good solutions that has been developed? Well, I would say that it's the problem is it's much easier to see that on the climate related issues rather than the biodiversity. Because uh, if I talk about the biodiversity, I can go back <laughs> 200 years. I can go that journey when we talk with our farmers, how they can uh, change their farmlands. So make sure that they are either they go full ecological or at least do not use the same kind of, of, uh, of pesticides and stuff like that. So we can move uh, quite a lot. And we, we've done that. But one thing we shouldn't discuss is, of course, also that it sounds like it's always simple to do one thing. But let's be clear that there are some conflicts here when it comes to at least the, the fight on climate change and, and uh, the issue with biodiversity. Look at the uh, deforestation and look at the discussion that's happening right now in Sweden, where we have tons of, of, of uh, 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 fir trees that uh, uh, are used to take over um, plastic material, but on the other hand, the means that bio biodiversity is hit. And this is an issue that will come much more. Mm. Yeah, you highlight the fact that there are so many dilemmas. Uh, there certainly is um, social um, objectives or climate versus nature, uh, the need to invest in new infrastructure and renewable energy, etc., etc. Are, are we able to handle those dilemmas I in, a, in a good way? Yes. Well, of course, it's simple to say. And sometimes I play with the idea when I'm in, so you read the headlines, what's the IPCC today, you read the headlines, and we're getting into dangerous uh, uh, times. I think, okay, so let's, we need to put that on the top. But then you realize, the more you think about, you realize, okay, so, it comes together. If uh, uh, women are not treated right, uh, we will have other problems. If we don't have too much, we have too much inequalities. We have other problems. If we don't have biodiversity. So everything maps together with the UN Sustainable Development Goals. But of course, I think you need to do some uh, linear programming. You need to make sure mm -hmm. that the shadow price is similar in all places. I'm sorry for being so mathematical. Mm -hmm. But I think in the end, that's what it's all about. Yeah. Be there, take the debate, and as especially you in the UN Global, Global Compact do, discuss things, because it's the discussion that brings this forward. Mm. Let's go back to the rationale for, for finance sector to, to work with the nature and also the economic rationale here. Um, traditionally, uh, safeguarding biodiversity, safeguarding nature has, has been about uh, conservation. Uh, but is there any business case in conservation? Uh, or are we now looking into completely different models, uh, business models that could actually be a business case? Uh, Akansha? That's an important question. Um, and I think also lends to the point that both Jan Erik and Jens were making earlier about potential trade-offs uh, and discussions that we actually need to make as society. So um, at the UN Convention on Biological Diversity, COP15, uh, which will happen this year, one of the pieces that is being discussed uh, as one of the targets is uh, the world should be able to have 30% of the land and marine areas fully protected. Uh, so this, of course, is a midterm goal with the long-term goal of 2050 being that 50% of the land should be uh, protected. And of course, you can go into the technicality of what uh, protection means. Uh, but it again goes that if land is limited, and we heard in previous panels as well, that if we have to continue feeding the growing population, how will land actually get used? Uh, so I think that's one question. The second is we've always looked at conservation done by either the indigenous and peoples, uh, indigenous and local communities, because they form less than 5% of the world's population, but safeguard 80% of the biodiversity with very little financing support from us. The second is in the COP26 discussion, and I think Jan Eric uh, referred to that earlier, is we are starting to finally talk about a carbon price. Uh, and that completely changes the business model for why you should be doing conservation. 
because traditionally the money for conservation either came from philanthropy or it came from aid from either do like donor agencies or government sector. But today you have corporates who are looking at their net zero pathways, recognizing that yes, they have to do the transition for their energy consumption, but in the meantime, there is an offset which is required or a compensation which is required. So you can actually look at nature-based climate solutions and pump in more money for conservation. Uh, and this became more and more clear during pandemic when there was severe fiscal stress in countries. So they could not even pay the salaries for park rangers. So the question is, do, would you rather take the corporate money or would you actually just let um, a conservation outcomes suffer? So I feel that entire space is shifting um, and you are moving towards even price um, of like 100 euros or 200 euros in the next uh, year. So if I am a landowner, should I grow wheat on that land or should I actually plant trees and protect those trees if the market is willing to pay me for it? So I feel like the shift is here. We just need to make sure that it is sustained and we need to make sure uh, that there is a right pricing for it. So I think pricing institutions and outcomes have to go hand in hand. Mm -hmm. Jens, what do you think about such a model? Could that work? Well, uh, I can't change the idea or the discussion there is excellent because in the end, I mean, if you come for World Economic Forum, you talk about the economic solutions. Uh, so it matters. And what also matters is that I see there as a business people and it's, this is not a debate led by politicians. It's strange when I meet policy people right now, they don't talk so much about this. When I meet business people, they talk about nothing but climate change, but biodiversity, uh, by sort of the UN Sustainable Development Goals. And the power, take the 3,000 bureaucrats in Brussels and add in all the business people and business women uh, all around the world, well, then we can change the world. So you're asking politicians and bureaucrats to step up? Uh, I think politicians should stand up uh, because they have been, uh, they, they were, they started the discussion, but now uh, sometimes when they see problems coming up because uh, uh, certain interest groups are advocating against it, they get weaker. And then it's uh, our time to step forward. And look what happened in the US not that long ago. You saw that a, a question you thought that everybody agreed upon suddenly was off the table. But what then happened was that the insurance companies, the, uh, uh, the banks, uh, the companies, the Teslas, they saw the opportunities rather uh, than, than the politicians. Mm. Yeah, Can I think just you jump also... in here to yeah, second what Jens was saying is there's a report that came out last week by B Team and Business for Nature, which shows that we are pumping about $1.8 trillion of harmful subsidies. So there is definitely a need for a public sector reform in terms of where the public money is going, but also level the playing field so that businesses can actually do the right thing. Jan Erik, what do you think about the, the business model that the Akansha laid out? Oh, I, I, as I said, uh, I, I do think the awareness on nature-based solutions to even climate changes um, you know, is, is gaining traction. Um, and the further regulation we have um, from governments supporting business initiatives, if you like, or business uh, opportunities, uh, the faster that, you know, the market will will do its job. Um, so I think that's part of it. I, I think also the work that is done by many um, in order to raise the awareness of the challenge we have in nature, uh, you know, improve the insight in, in how we can resolve it is actually also, you know, having a, a, an effect on, on, on the public opinion. Or of course, that in itself is a business opportunities for companies uh, like Unilever, for instance. They have now committed to a deforestation free supply chain by 2023. Of course, it's also positioning them as a leading brand and a strong brand in the consumer eyes, if this becomes an important topic for consumers. And uh, the fish farming company like Greek Seafood 
um, you know, solvent farming after pressure, you know, uh, they have enforced upon their Brazilian soya uh, suppliers to implement a 100% deforestation-free soybean value chain. Uh, and they can, of course, position their product in the marketplace uh, using these attributes. So I think it's both on the solution side, but also in terms of uh, actually nurturing uh, and, and shifting consumer preferences. Hmm. Akansha, shifting consumer preferences, how do we do that? Um, so I, I do want to mention an initiative that the World Economic Forum last, launched last year, uh, which is called 100 million farmers and 1 billion consumers. So mm -hmm. I do second what Yannarek was saying, that yes, you can create the change with the farmer and the supply side, but you also need to work with consumers and consumer groups so that they are willing to, one, recognize the difference uh, in the supply chain. Uh, second, perhaps when they are able, and I won't say that there is a blanket that everybody has to pay a premium, but when they are able to actually start paying a premium for what they consume in terms of food and fiber, um, to be able to make that change. Because I know that we've spoken a lot about food today and not as much about fiber, which is also a big driver. So much of the uh, textile waste today, uh, which is often also from polyester, goes into landfill. So you're using uh, polymers coming out of oil and gas, and you are then pumping it into the earth, which means that you're never get, going to get lost. Uh, so if you're wearing a $3 t-shirt, you should be worried about where it is coming from on the E and the S and the G side of things. Um, so I fully agree that we need to work more with consumers. Uh, and one good example that we have seen is on plastic. Uh, when the documentary with Sir David Attenborough came out, that completely changed the way we look at plastic and demanding our governments. So at the UNEA this month, there's actually a discussion going on on a plastic pollution ban treaty. Uh, so I think that's one case scenario of something that has worked well. We just need to see more and more of these, particularly when it comes to uh, organic farming and um, uh, regenerative agriculture, uh, and also looking at just clothing and apparel and fashion industry. Mm. And just, just to, to uh, you know, add to that, uh, on this uh, IPDD, initiative we had on deforestation engaging with governments of course uh, many are aware we engage heavily with brazil um, i must say the action on the ground is not encouraging um, even so uh, we engage with uh, indonesia but we have also started engaging with uh, the uh, eu and to mobilize if you like the three thousand bureaucrats uh, you refer to yes uh, how they, as a, uh, as a buyer, how, you know, how could you put in force um, requirements um, when you talk about EU as a consumer of, for instance, of soybeans? So I, I think, uh, you know, addressing the demand side uh, is, is really important. And, uh, of course, making the reference to, to climate, um, it's also important there. I mean, there... We, we have to address the demand for oil uh, if we are to be successful. Can I just compliment something over there? Yeah. Uh, because uh, I like what he said, because when we say consumer, we just think about an individual consumer, but there is also the consumption signal that is given by policymakers. So uh, this ban on imported deforestation and this brilliant work that is being done by IPDD I couldn't second more of that because it's it's not putting that pressure on you and me. It's actually making sure that the supermarkets, that the cons like even commodity importers are putting that uh, into consideration. Mm. We're now in a few weeks time. Uh, the new international uh, or next international negotiations on, on the nature and biodiversity are continuing. What are your expectations uh, from those negotiations and, and for hopefully an, an agreement? Jens, you first. A Paris agreement, same thing. Will we get that? I have no clue. <laughs> I don't know, but, but uh, Asha, Akancha is sort of, she's nodding her head. So I think she knows better than me on that. <laughs> well, you no, think a Paris uh, agreement that will have the same kind of mobilizing effect uh, uh, as it had on climate? 
No, well, to be honest, I don't think so. Uh, I think it would be needed. But uh, uh, if you look on, on young people, I think it's, uh, I mean, let's, let's get back to what we talked about and Akansha and Jaren Eric talked about the trade-offs. Uh, when you talk with young people, they are engaged in climate. And we need to make uh, a concerted, put a concerted effort to make sure that people understand that biodiversity and, and climate goes hand in hand. Um, the problem is that uh, there are, as I said before, there are things or actually uh, uh, solutions where they don't. And how do you mix that and how do you find that? And that will be an issue that will be brought up uh, and I think will be intensified. Look here in Sweden, we have intense discussions on uh, the, the, uh, both between mining and uh, so that can help build electrical cars and electrical batteries and the problem it has to do uh, creates for the microenvironment. We have mm. forest uh, where we have a lot tons of uh, old forest trees or firs that uh, uh, you're not allowed to cut down because you say it's about uh, uh, um, biodiversity. That is the issue that w will come up in, in, in the coming years, more and more. Mm. Yeah, that's uh, one an another example of those dilemmas that we have that we need to, to, uh, to balance on a societal level. Jan-Erik, what's your expectations from an international agreement on, on biodiversity? Um, well, I, I think it, it's uh, coming back to we, we need to establish the, the overall ambitions uh, in the same way we did with, with uh, climate. Uh, of course, there will be different pathways for different countries, for different companies. Uh, but we have to agree on the overall ambition. I think that's key. Uh, and then make sure, you know, everybody has to make their portfolios or businesses uh, nature aligned. Uh, the second thing I'm, I'm hoping for is, of course, that uh, we are successful in terms of establishing something like the net zero uh, for nature that is very tangible that becomes a business imperative for all uh, and uh, uh, where you can set not only long-term targets but also targets for 2025 or 2030 mm. that's what i'm hoping for at least mm. akasha what are you hoping for um i think a mix of uh, everything i have heard so far so definitely agree uh, with what Jens had said and Jan Eric said as well is, um, I mean, in, in 1992, we had three Rio conventions. So biodiversity, climate change, desertification. Uh, for some reason, we forget about the two conventions and we focus so much on climate change. That's what uh, catches uh, public attention, investment, everything. Um, so I agree that just being able to communicate in something similar like Paris was able to do or uh, NetZero was able to do. There is a group of uh, high-level NGOs who are coming together to ask for a global goal for nature, uh, so called uh, nature positive, uh, with uh, ability to be able to break it down then into indicators and metrics. Um, so I think that's one, definitely. Uh, the second is, uh, as Jan Eric said, is we know that the targets themselves are not going to change the world. What they do is give a signal and a, a a signal to the market and to the governments to be able to align their efforts, their portfolios to what a nature positive future and a nature positive pathway can look like. So I think that would be the second ambition from my side. Um, and then the third for me personally, and the fact that we are speaking uh, in an uh, event focused on food systems would be one, uh, if there can be an agreement on the number for uh, reforming, repurposing environmental harmful subsidies of which agriculture subsidy is a big part. Uh, and then the second is a future pathway for agriculture input companies. Like how can we move towards uh, agriculture which is not heavy on chemical inputs? So I think for me, those would be the things like more the macro nature positive ambition, uh, but then also have pathways for uh, key industries like um, chemicals and agriculture inputs and food and land use. Mm -hmm. We just have a few minutes uh, left uh, of this session, so please uh, let's round up now and, and summarize with if you now you get the chance to give one challenge uh, uh, to or one tip to the um, uh, listeners uh, of this webinar. 
Jens, what would you be your, your challenge? Well, my challenge will be do the same thing as you did with TCFD. Uh, look at all the risks that you have in this area and look at all the opportunities you have. And uh, I can just look at my own bank. Uh, let's, if we look backwards, I would say that the times we got into problems where we did not live uh, uh, sustainable uh, financing, when we lent out money to people that either could not pay back or they did not run a sustainable business. That's where we lost the money. How do we gain money? Well, by uh, helping companies to uh, go green. Uh, I would say you can do the same thing here. You can get rid of risk and make more money. Mm. Jan Erik, what's your challenge to the listeners? I'll say uh, the same thing as I said uh, regarding climate. Um, words come easy, actions don't. Akasha? Um, I think for me it would be that uh, all of these challenges are intertwined between climate, biodiversity, pollution and land. Um, so make sure that you do a materiality assessment which cuts across these pieces uh, and not just look at it in silos. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, that was the, the ending of this uh, panel session this afternoon about the role of finance. Uh, I can uh, sense a bit of optimism. Uh, the nature and biodiversity is definitely on the agenda for business, but we still need more clear frameworks. We need mo even more clear policies, uh, and we need uh, market pricing in, in one way or another. That's what I how I read your, your messages here. Thank you so much to all three panelists. Thank you. And great moderation as well. Thank you. Thank you so much to, to all the, the great panels we had today. We managed to uh, build in three executive uh, Nordic talks into one forum and another Norwegian uh, talk on, on the food system. Uh, let me first thank the Nordic Council of Ministers for the economic support to, to carry this through. It has been a great pleasure to be working with you the last, uh, last year, really, since we got uh, the funding. Uh, and of course, all of the, the moderators, you've seen them, uh, brilliant uh, moderation, uh, and the speakers uh, on a very high level throughout the day. Uh, I'm also going to end up by saying a big, big thank you to the technical staff that are just around me here. Uh, thank you so much for all the work you've done to make sure that we could, could meet uh, digitally. Uh, and just to wrap up, just to remind you that we at the UN Global Compact, we are here for you. We are here for our members and partners to make sure that we can ensure the transition and not only the talk. So for us, it is important now to, to have, of course, we need these discussions. We need to, to, to identify what are the uh, roads forward. But we have now, we are about to set down, put together a task force on what should a national recommendation on transition plan look like. Because, I mean, we are at at the brink of a change that we are not really managing to do. We, we have the knowledge about the climate crisis. We have the knowledge about the challenges we face in other areas. We have a technology. And still, transition shows to be really difficult, both on a personal level, on a society level, and for business. So that is the reason why we, we encourage you to engage with the, our work on the task force on transition plans, uh, but not least to engage with us on the new competence program that we have just launched, where you get help to set science-based targets that you heard about today, both on climate and further down the road also on nature. You have the opportunity to work on your strategy on sustainability goals if you don't have something like that. And not at least the Norwegian uh, transparency law, the openness law, openheads law uh, on human rights in business. So please engage, you get more information about this on our homepage. And with those uh, ending uh, commercial words, uh, I'm going to say thank you so much for joining us today and have a safe uh, and sustainable rest of the day. <laughs>